equal first event of the Queen's Park Book Festival and how appropriate that it's a football event kicking off the festival. <laughs> anyway, without further ado, they need no introduction, but let me say uh, just a couple of words. We're delighted uh, and very, very appreciative of the fact that we have these guests with us to talk about so much in the football world and more. Uh, first of all, Ricky Hill, Luton Town and England. Hey. Ricky's book is Love of the Game, The Man Who Brought the Rooney Rule to the UK, published just a few months ago. Pat Nevin of Chelsea, Everton, uh, Kilmarnock, Motherwell, Clyde, <laughs> Gambia Rovers, and Chief Executive of Motherwell as well. Um, and Pat's book, The Accidental Footballer, is also very recently out. And in the referee's uh, seat, uh, or dugout, or whatever we want to call it, is Richard Foster, local football author, blogger, podcaster extraordinaire, and author of Premier League Nuggets. <laughs> so I'll leave, it to, uh, I'll leave it to Richard to blow the whistle on what I'm sure will be a fascinating um, two halves, or one half. Over to you. Thank you very much, Hugh. I can't keep up with your puns, so I'm going to try and keep it nice and uh, straight. So, uh, yeah, so obviously... I think most people in this tent will know the two gentlemen to my left and my right. Um, I see them really as kindred spirits because both of them were really, for different reasons, outsiders in the world of football. Um, and in fact, Pat's uh, nickname, I don't know if you know this, at Chelsea was Weirdo. <laughs> uh, I've had some nicknames, never been called Weirdo, I must say. But uh, they both grew up in what would be considered hotbeds of football. so. Pat grew up in Glasgow, Ricky is a local man so he grew up in Brent and obviously you've seen a lot of footballers come from Glasgow and Brent and um, these are two of the finest uh, examples of uh, Glaswegian and Brentian <laughs> footballers. Uh, very different types of players, Pat I think was probably described as a tricky winger uh, in your day um, and Ricky was more I would say a robust Rumbustuous midfielder, is that okay? And winger. And winger and uh, everywhere. Let's get out as well. But um, I just think it was, it was interesting looking at uh, both their books. Uh, the other thing that unites them, which may be something that isn't so uh, well known, is that they both just missed out on the Premier League. So the Premier League started in 1992, which is the year that Pat decided to move from Everton to Tranmere. Tranmere have never been in the Premier League, although they were very close three times, failed in the playoffs every time. Sorry about that. Ricky moved not to Tranmere, but to Tampa in 1992. Uh, and uh, that is obviously not part of the Premier League because it's in America. So that didn't really work. So what I wanted, the first question I wanted to start off with is that considering you both retired, let's say, many years ago, what motivated you to write a book sort of almost 30 years after you actually retired from playing football? Uh, Pat. Oh, I will first. Uh, first of all, thank you for having us here. It's lovely to be here. Um, I wasn't motivated to write a book originally, um, simply because I'd never quite got around to it. I thought about it a few times. I've been writing for years anyway from newspapers and whatever, lots of different things. And I had a love of literature anyway. But I put it off and put it off because uh, many individuals had suggested I should write one. So eventually I was down at, I'm not going to say where I was, right? But the initials are Chelsea Football Club. And uh, somebody said something to me and it infuriated me so much that I went away angry because they told me to stop writing what I felt and start going online and copying what was online. See what was in tweeting, see what was you know, trending at the time, and write that. And I went, really? You don't want to hear my opinion? And they said, no, no, no. That's how you get the punters in, and that's how we get more advertising. Look at what they're saying, and basically say that back to them. I was so angry. I was fuming, and I just thought, no, forget this. I'm going to write what I want to write, and no one's going to tell me what to do. But I was that angry that I was, I jumped on a train because I had to fly up to Scotland again. I had a five hour wait. By the time I got on the plane, I'd written 10,000 words. <laughs> and three weeks later, I'd written 120,000 words. 
So that anger lasted a wee while. <laughs> <laughs> but it was lovely doing it. And that's what actually made me, me do it. Because we live in a world just now where you can, we know about fake news, but truth has been so skewered um, in various ways. And I just thought, I can't have this anymore. I would rather just be honest. And I would like to tell my honest story. Um, and also, I don't have to be great fun. <laughs> I love doing it. So that's kind of why I did it now. Oh. Well, um, as I say, someone who writes and has written the odd book, um, that's an interesting motivation. And, and I think you're absolutely right. And I think it's a shame that the modern world is that people write for clicks and various other things. They don't write for the proper reasons. So talking about the proper reasons, Ricky, why did, why did you suddenly decide, I need to write a book? Well, I guess it wasn't um, a reason per se. I've never really thought about writing a book in my life. I've not been the type of person that liked to put himself out into the public domain at all. I had to be bullied to get a Twitter account like six years ago. But um, Sue Regis, I was in Chicago on a working assignment for three months. I got a call in the middle of the night that said Sue Regis, who was my close friend that lived a couple of miles away from here, passed away. Um, and I was in the middle of the night, I cried myself to sleep and I thought, oh, the fragility of life, it could happen to me at any time. And have I left my story? People, do people really know who I am? That was the first reason I thought, let me start. And that was, I actually started the book on that trip. I was like to write, similar to Pat, just got on the computer and started to put down the basics of the beginning, the middle, the end, as I saw through my lens. And the second part was also the, when I was a manager at Luton Town for four months, and I got released after four months, and that kind of was a, a issue to me in respects to, I spent 15 years at the club, I was probably one of the most renowned players at that era, managed to play for England, all those type of things, and I was given four months as a manager, and the, the public didn't really understand or didn't know what had taken place at that time. Um, and I just kind of slipped away into like a thief in the night as if nothing happened. And I was really disrespected and ill-treated and it was the right place at the wrong time. So I thought, let me get that part of the story out so people at least understand what took place then. So that was the beginning and the reason in, as, in my estimation as to why I wrote the, the book. I was fortunate that Adrian Durham, who I'd been friends with for many years realized what I was doing. He asked for kiddie help and he helped guide me through it, which was wonderful. And Adrian obviously is a wonderful journalist. His first before he was a media radio presenter, he was a journalist by trade. So that was a great help as well. And from my perspective, after doing it, I feel great that it's out there. Um, and it's kind of cathartic to a degree. And now you know, I'm looking for the next stage of my life. Great, because um, I think Looking at both books, which I have read, by the way, um, they are very unusual because I'm sure a lot of people here have written or have read football autobiographies or biographies. They're not the greatest pieces of literature in the world. Um, these two books, I think, stand out because they come with a real passion and there are issues that are raised that are very important. Uh, your normal football autobiography takes you, you know, from their journey and usually just talks about their, the game, it's, you know, the games, the matches, the goals. These books, which I would highly recommend, go much deeper than that and they look at, at lots of different issues. But I also think the thing that unites you two is, uh, and it, it's actually obviously in the title of Ricky's book, Love of the Game. You both still love this game. And, uh, Gareth Southgate, when he took over as England manager, he said, and this is the quote, I have to say, I'm involved in a sport that I love and an industry that at times I don't like. Now, Gareth Southgate's a very diplomatic guy. I think he sums up the dichotomy of a lot of people's attitude towards football. And I'm gonna ask you both to, to talk about this a little bit. So you, Ricky's book, the opening sentence is, I have always loved football and I still love it. Okay, so that's the opening sentence. Pat's uh, line in his epilogue, strangely, so at the end is, being a footballer is what I do, not who I am. So Ricky, uh, could you talk a little bit about, you know, that love of the game which you still maintain, but also 
you know, the element of disillusion. So there's a bit of a dichotomy here. You love it, but there are elements of it that you're not so keen on. Being brought, born in the UK um, in the 60s, or late 50s, into 60s, it was a difficult position or, or time for ethnic minorities and black ethnic minorities that arrived on the Windrush era. We were first generation black British born, and we didn't have many role models while growing through at school that looked like us in higher positions. And how I started my journey in football was I saw the 1965 Cup final, Liverpool versus Leeds, black and white TV, and I'm at home. And I just looked when they were doing the ceremonies beforehand, presenting the, the dignitaries to the players, and there was someone in a white kit. And I didn't know who it was. And I didn't know what the sides were. And he looked like me. In my mind, as a child, six years old, that person looked like me. And I transformed myself into his body to say, that's how I want to be. I turned around to my brother and I said to my brother, what team is that? He said, it's Leeds United. I said, okay, that's my team, Leeds. I still didn't know who the player was. From that day to now, Leeds United are my team. Anything to do with Leeds and Yorkshire, Yorkshire cricket, Leeds rugby, anything to do, that was my, I, I favoured them. Because I saw someone who I wanted to be like. That was the, the spark that said, I want to be a professional footballer. It was then further reinforced when I was seven years old in the playground with the school teacher. Um, the dinner lady was there and she said, Ricky, what do you want to be? And I was playing football at the time. I said, Miss, I'm going to be a footballer. She said, oh, Ricky, only two out of 800 will become footballers, professional footballers. I said, well, Miss, I'm going to be one of those two. And that has always been my overriding passion that I wanted to be a, a, a footballer. I loved the game as a child. I had an older brother, which was great. It was as equally a good talented footballer as me, if not better. Um, but he was never given an opportunity in British football. Because at that time, there was a lot of stereotypes that were going around about black people that were obviously false and misperceptions. But they were allowed to permeate throughout the industry about our character, about our lack of ability to do various things, about our uh, volatile nature, everything you can imagine. So those things were allowed to go throughout the industry so therefore, there was not very many black players that I could see as I was growing 11, 12, 13 years old, apart from Pele, apart from Eusebio, who were just brilliant players. So I thought, I want to try to emulate those. Um, the system wasn't always great for that. I was at school with Steve Gatting, who played for Arsenal and, and Brighton as a wonderful player, and Steve and I were in the same year group. Steve was selected for Middlesex County when we were 14 years old. I didn't go to the trials, admittedly, I'd broken my wrist. But he went to Arsenal schoolboys straight away, was signed up to Arsenal. And university in the school, people would suggest that I was the better player, but I was nowhere involved in professional in the professional game. So, but it's always been that drive for me to try to emulate. It was Albert Johansson was the player, the left winger for Leeds. And I've always said, well, I wanted to try to do that. Because if I can aspire to be at that level, it then will maybe give someone else an inspiration that they will also want to try that. So that was my football career, and in post that, I've always said I wanted to be a coach or manager. And they hadn't, again, it was that same second fight for equality, because there weren't any black managers that I could look to with previous track records that could then have created a pathway for acceptance. And the same stereotypical, lazy, stereotypical um, comments were made about our capabilities to manage, to lead men. And I've tried to keep battling away, chipping away to see if I can change that perception of people. Okay. Pat, how about you? So you, you love the game, but you, you do point out in your book there are certain aspects of the game that you thought were, you know, borderline awful. I, in the 1980s, I refused to do the kind of shoot and match kind of interviews that the players did, the old steak and chip stuff, because I thought they were so dull. Right. So when they asked me questions like, what do you like about football? I said, playing. What do you dislike about it? everything else that was my answer it didn't go down that well in shit um but it used to drive me slightly mad because i actually loved it i mean the absolute truth of it is i tried really hard not to be a professional footballer and failed and it's kind of unusual position to actually come across but and it sounds a bit odd because you love the game but talking of dichotomies as we were if you love something i didn't i didn't want it to be ruined by the actual 
the business side of it. Yeah, you because know, anything you love, you do for pure love. If it becomes your job, that's great, but it also can be ruined for you as well when it becomes that job. So I didn't want that to happen. Also, I had brothers who were, you know, fabulously talented as well in football, and they all went and done higher education and further education, and sisters as well. And I just thought that was normal way. So, I mean, that sounds like a line, like a good sell, sell point for a book. Yeah. Well, in actual fact, Chelsea tried to buy me when I was 19, or 18. And I said, no, I turned them down for a year because I was doing a degree in Glasgow. I'm very happy there, a girlfriend, things were great. Why ruin that? And I could play football for fun. Um, so I had this fun side of it. But I decided after a while, for very complicated reasons, um, to, to have a go at it, you know, the year after that. And while I had a year to wait and think about it, I thought to myself, do you know what? I'm not going to let it be ruined. I'm not going to let the business side of it ruined. I'm not going to let the ugly sides of it. And boy, as Ricky well knows, there are ugly sides that not just of football, but then come into football. So, you know, what Ricky, you put up with down here, well, those are who are old enough, and I don't think there's anyone old enough here, but those are who are old enough will remember the signs, you know, no blacks, no dogs, no Irish. Do you notice who's at the bottom of that list then? Being Patrick Kevin Francis Michael, right, up in Glasgow, the sectarianism was horrendous, right? And that was that was what we had to put off with in those early days. Again, a little bit of history, if I can tell you very quickly. Um, I'd left Celtic as a kid because I wasn't going to, I was going to go do a degree. And as I was playing in a boys club game, the Glasgow Rangers scout came up to me and he's walking over. In those days I was a centre forward. I did, I'd never played in a wing before when Chelsea. And he walked towards me, and I'm thinking, just to let everyone who doesn't know here, Rangers in a hundred years had never signed a Roman Catholic, right? And this guy's walking up to me in front of 200 people, and I'm going, oh, for God's sake. <laughs> and he's walked up, and he said to me, hello, my name is, and he told me his name, and I've said, my name is Patrick Kevin Francis Michael. <laughs> he went, thanks, and just walked over. <laughs> so the, the hatred, the bigotries, and for my book, and I won't go on too much about it here, there are chapters on homophobia. There's a chapter on, at least one chapter on racism. If we can talk about Paul Carnival, a great, great friend of mine, afterwards and what he went through at Chelsea. But it doesn't matter what it was. Anyone being treated because of race, religion, sexuality, anything. In 1983, I thought that was weird. It sounds normal now. Trust me, it was an outsider's view then, wasn't it? very much an outsider's view then. And that's why I got the term weirdo. Because, you know, I would be arguing for these points then. And it was very difficult. So for all the difficult times we're going through just now, it is now, nice now, that it's on the agenda. They're all on the agenda. And we keep them on the agenda, which I think is the important thing to do. Um, you, you mentioned Paul Canneville, obviously. Uh, I actually was at that match because I'm a Palace fan. So, just to fill people in who don't know, there was a game, Crystal Palace against Chelsea, Paul Cannaval, well actually Pat, why don't you take over the story, so Paul Cannaval was a substitute for Chelsea and he came on and that was his debut, you were playing in that game, what happened at that point? At the end, I don't want to take over your questions, there's a question I'd love to, to answer, uh, Ricky to answer, yes. um, which is really important. But I'd come down and I'd been a student, and if you can imagine a Glasgow student, bit of lefty, right? You know, you know what students were in those days. Um, so I, I'd been on all the marches and the, the anti-racism, the you know, everything. I mean, my hero was was not necessarily Jimmy Johnson who played for Celtic. I had a post of Steve Biko in my room, right? So I had a slightly different position that I was coming from, you know, Nelson Mandela, a hero, all that sort of stuff, right? So I'd come down to play for Chelsea. And in my first season, it went well. I managed to get player of the year, which was a bit weird and unexpected. And I was playing at Palace one day, and the fans were booing Paul Canada. Um, and they were called, all the usual noises, you know the ones, I won't even lower myself to say it, but it was vile. And there were thousands all singing and making these noises. And uh, I scored the winning goal, one nil, and after the game said, I'm refusing to talk to the, the press about the game. I don't care about my headlines, all that sort of stuff. I'm just disgusted because a, any fans should do that. But worse still, they were the Chelsea fans that were doing it. I was like, my fury was beyond belief. So 
obviously the people's were quite nice and they, but they, they to, to be honest, this is to tell you how times have changed. Even the pressmen didn't know how to deal with that then, did they? They had no idea. Because it wasn't a thing. Casual racism was normalised in those days. So I was furious. Um, anyway, they, t- they did the, the right thing. And they, they reported that the next day and the Monday. And I was quite happy about that. But what I wanted, and it was important, was the next game, Canners and I were going to walk out together. And we were playing a game, I think it was Shrewsbury, because we hadn't been promoted at that point. And I made sure that the golden boy, Kerry Dixon, was walking beside us. Mm-hmm. So the three of us walked out together. And our fans sang Paul's name before theirs. Mm-hmm. And that moment, I thought, I can make a difference. Mm-hmm. And, I, and, and that's why that became an important point for me, and realised that we must all speak up when we can speak up. It was a long, hard slog. And again, I felt as if I could talk about it all the time back then. Nobody else seemed to want to talk about it. And that's what I was interested in. Ricky, did anyone ever want to talk about it then? Because I didn't feel anyone did. You're 100% right, Pat. Um, what you've just outlined regarding Paul, obviously from my own experience, I got into the first team at Luton at 17 years old in one month. Just came off of the bench and had an impact straight away. Scored a goal, made a goal. And the majority of fans, 95% of the fans in the ground, didn't even know who I was. I'd only been at the club for five months. And then at the end of the season came, we had one more game, and I was man of the match in that game as well. And the following year, we kicked off a couple of games at Sunderland away um, in the League Cup. And, and my first away game in the league was Burnley. And I went out for the warm up and 2 30 ish time. Just going out, doing my normal stretches, and then you just hear these noises, monkey noises going on in different areas of the people that came early. So, okay, no problem. Went back in, came back out at three o'clock, and the crowd had obviously swelled, and 15,000 there at the time. And their main crowd is on the length of the field. So you've got the whole, that's the main, it's about 5,000 it holds there, and you're behind the goal. Now three quarters of the crowd are singing songs. They've made up, very creative, they made up songs. How much is the W in the window, and he's a C, he's blacker than you and me. And all these various things, and the whole crowd are singing. I've looked at my teammates, I'm 17, and I'm the only black player anywhere on the field, anywhere in the stadium, in anywhere. And my teammates got this sadness in their eyes. And I've said, okay, so I've just, the game started, and you just got into it. You, obviously you're a footballer, this is my dream. I wasn't going to let anyone take my dream away. You know, who are these people? I'm just going to show them what a good player I am and spoil their weekend. That was my way of looking at everything. As it worked out, I scored the winning goal <laughs> at Burnley, headed it in top corner, and silence came off. After the match, I didn't realise at the time that Harry Haslam had, in the book I reference it, Harry Haslam had been asked by the reporters, you know, about the terrible behaviour and abuse that the player got. And he said, well, don't worry about that. He said, he, he went in one ear and out the other. And for me, that was kind of strange because no one ever asked me about it. And to this day, and I finished my playing career many years ago, that is, not one coach, not one manager ever said to me, Ricky, don't worry about that abuse. Don't worry about that whatever you're getting. They're just idiots. They refused to even mention it like it wasn't even there. And you know, whether they didn't know what to ask because they didn't have an answer that I might ask them, well, what are you going to do about it? No one touched upon it. You know, David Pleat, who's Jewish himself, who's been obviously through a lot of discrimination in his own way, he was my manager for 12 years. He never mentioned it. So we were just left to get on and deal with it as best we could. If we were not capable of holding that within us and playing to a certain level, we'd have possibly found ourselves out of the game and out of a career. But I wasn't, as I said, I wasn't going to let anyone verbally affect me to stop me from having the career that I wanted and I dreamt about. Um, I mean, I, I still find it very unsettling, this sort of thing. And it, as, as Pat points out, the, there, it, the situation, you don't get that at football grounds now, but you still get a certain element. And we have seen it, you know, in the Euros, you know, when... Uh, our players missed those penalties they got disgraceful abuse on social media and social media unfortunately allows these people to basically vent their anger or whatever is wrong with them uh, against 
players, whether they're black or they're gay or whatever it might be, that seems to be still there. But you say that, you know, within the media there are now, do you feel the media has changed, Ricky, from what it was, you know, in your early days as a player and now we're at that situation where it is raised, but obviously there are elements still out there? Without a doubt, you know, it's, it's there to, to be seen by everyone. Every newspaper will be up in arms, particularly when there's issues abroad in terms of racism or acts of racism against our players. Um, suddenly we highlight it, there's, a, there's awareness of it. There's no real idea as to how we can address it correctly. And I know John Barnes speaks very well on, on this point all the time. He says it's society and it's a societal issue. Football is just a micro, micro, microcosm, is it microcosm? Microcosm of it, we of society. Um, and we, um, unfortunately, as players, are just part of a, an, a team. Fans are tribal. They have their own issues in terms of their beliefs and values that they come to the games with. No one can legislate for anyone's behaviour once they get through the, the door and they pay their money. And if they have tendencies where they discriminate in whatever grounds in their own private lives, and it's something I believe that is taught, it's not something that you're born with, it's a learnt behaviour and it's environmental behaviour, I don't know how football can actually address that, those issues, um, from the behavioural respect of racism. The other side of things, where the, the covert in terms of the inequalities of racism within the industry, I'm sure there are lots of things that the organisations, institutions can do if there's an appetite and a willingness to do it. To date, there hasn't really been that. There's been a lot of performative empathy, but not a lot of action as far as I'm concerned. Mm. Well, and Pat, you're obviously working in the media now. So from inside the media, what, how do you see things? Do you think there is change coming or do you think that's still a long way off? Um, I, I have to be so brutally honest, even when it's not very comfortable. Change coming, yes, because change has already come. We've come a long way, and we've got, we've got a long way to go, and we don't stop off it. Um, I'll, tell you, I'll, I'll take you back a few days then. Um, I was driving down to London. I had to drive, so annoying. Uh, the other day there, I had to do a Chelsea game. And I stopped off at a um, service station. And so it was just, what was the last game there? Chelsea's last game. Yeah. What, the one in Europe? Yeah, yeah. Europe. Zenit, 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 Zenit. So I'm driving down, but I've stopped halfway, just about Leeds. You'd have been very jealous, Ricky. <laughs> <laughs> I stopped about Leeds, and there's a tweet on my phone. I don't usually, I mean, I tweet religiously every single year, at least once. <laughs> so there's a tweet in my phone, right? And on the phone, I was sitting there looking at it, and it's John McGinn, who used to who played for Scotland, but he used to play for Hibs. It was my team in Scotland, right? Um, and there's a reason why I support Hibs, the best team in the world. But mm. apart from that, but he's he's been abused at Chelsea the week before when he was playing for Aston Villa. And it's vile, sectarian abuse. It's not affecting me, it doesn't matter, as I say, sectarian, homophobic, racial, doesn't matter. None of them. They're all, I'm not going to react the same way. So I did my annual tweet and said, that is absolutely disgusting. I will be in touch with the club immediately to see that this is taken care of. And I hope the club reacts well. Within 10 minutes, the club had a statement up. The club had approached Aston Villa. They had reported, come back to us. We got in touch with uh, we. I had talked to them about four different media organisations and Chelsea had done exactly the same. The club had done everything right. Everything. Absolutely everything. For the next two days, I get slaughtered on social media for being an apologist for racists, a apologist for sectarian people, for being a wee Fenian B, for being a wee <laughs> Orange B, for being, a, and that's why you have to take it on board. Social media is not a mirror to our society. It really isn't. The two weeks, three weeks before, I uh, turned 50 years of age, and in that, I got about a thousand positive tweets, and I felt like the way people generally normally are when I go about the world. But in the most things that you do in social media you do get the grime, you do get the scum, you do get that. We're in a very, very sad place if we decide the whole world and the, our whole society is like that, because some do it. 
we have to we have to try to those people, we have to get on top of them. But let's not ruin our lives by thinking their whole world is exactly like this. That one Chelsea fan shouted and bawled and screamed. There may be a few more Chelsea fans. But I can tell you, most Chelsea fans ain't like that. I met a lot of them. Spent time with them. You can walk through. The, the racial diversity in the Chelsea, on uh, Chelsea ground is absolutely incredible. So let's get a, a reality on it. Let's never for a moment say that that's it. People always make this mistake. You think, we're there now because you've said, you know, we've got somewhere. Yeah, we've got somewhere. But that gives us hope and belief and a will to keep that effort going. And that's what I always want to say, tell people as much as possible. So within the book, my book, we, are we talking about the books? Yeah. Right. yeah. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, I'll, I'll hold it up. For you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Within the book, a lot of the stories that I have, there's a whole chapter almost in homophobia. Within football. Now, just what happens, I'm straight, but it doesn't matter, I don't care. If I was gay, it wouldn't matter. A jot. But all the way through, I've said to people, like, just read these things. Hear what we've got to say and see if you feel the same way afterwards. Problem is, nobody listens unless you keep doing it. So, Going yeah. back to why do we do it? Well, I suppose that's one good reason to do it. But in the midst of it all, I will hopefully give lightness in there and a bit of fun in there. And while you're reading it, you're getting a bit of a laugh as well. Because you know the best way to laugh at these morons? The best way to be them is to laugh at them. It really is. To show them how ridiculous they are. And, and that's certainly one of my policies. Um. Moving on from that issue, which the related issue, and obviously your book, Ricky, again, I'll hold this one up, this is a book as well, um, Love of the Game, but it, the subtitle is The Man Who Brought the Rooney Rule to the UK. So, Ricky, if you could just explain what the Rooney Rule is, because some people may not know exactly what it is, and then your view of what that is in terms of what we're experiencing here in the UK. Because basically, I think we're now up to 250 Premier League managers, okay, so a guy who writes a book about Premier League should know this sort of thing. We're 248 actually, Patrick Vieira is 248. Of those 248, there have been 10 black managers. 10. And half of those are British. Uh, I think only one survived more than 12 months in his role, which was Chris Hewton, who's Irish, but... Um, the other four English managers, Paul Ince, uh, Chris Ramsey, Darren Moore, remind me of the other one, Ricky, would be... <laughs> anyway, the fourth one. <laughs> None of them lasted for more than nine months in their jobs, okay? And they're the only four black British managers we have had in 30 years, okay? So, Ricky, explain a little bit about the Rooney Rule. Uh, sorry, that's a bit of a setup. Um, yeah. And you know your view of it and why it needs to maybe be introduced into the UK. Because obviously it's an American idea. Well, thank you for outlining the um, numbers, which are that's proof and percentages. Yeah, it's pretty grave, um, but not totally unexpected in regards to the journey of the black footballer within the UK. Um, I mentioned earlier, we were first generation black British player who would then want to become first generation black British manager. There was no record or track record or no one that we could look to beforehand um, to, to kind of point the way to say, well, he was a success. There's no reason why Ricky or Cyril or Luther Blissett shouldn't be a su success likewise. So we had that obstacle straight away. In America, there's parallel lines regarding the transition from sports player into sports head coach, sports manager, sports senior executive for the black ex-player. And the NFL have sent the same black, black players. At the end of their careers, a number get brought into positions within the organizations as specialist coaches, linebackers, offensive, co not offensive coordinators, and wide receiver coaches, and various defensive line coaches. But the very few of them get to able to be ascend or elevated to the offensive coordinator, who's the guy that makes all the fancy plays for the side, the creative mind, or the head coach that puts all these pieces together. So, the Johnny Cochran, it was, and Cyrus Murray, Johnny Cochran of OJ Simpson fame, um, when he got off for the famous trial in America. And Cyrus Murray is a civil rights lawyer, Jewish, who took to Coca Cola to court for a discrimination case for 500 million or something ridiculous like that. 
they came together and they formed, they, they joined a party called the Fitzpollard Alliance. And they're a group that represents the ex-black players, particularly in terms of furthering their careers within the industry post their playing career. And they said, went to the owners of the NFL, the commissioner and all the owners, and said, you know, it's not really good enough. We've had one black coach in X amount of years or two black coaches in X amount of years. We think more needs to be done to enable a pathway to be created for those who are capable, those who are willing, those who have that desire to become coaches, to try to, to be allowed to elevate within their considered. So they came up with an idea whereby they created this ruling, an initiative that it, each club, when they had a vacancy for a position, at the head coaching position, the front office position, uh, senior front office position, or the president of the organization, they would interview at least one black minority ethnic person. Um, and if that person was good enough for the position, he would be considered for it. There was no guarantees, to, no obligation to give anyone a job. It was just to be able to access the rooms where decisions are being made. And that was a creative thing. They've it, now made it two uh, minority candidates to be able to address those who make the decisions again. Um, but they found during that time, and that was 2003, they created that. I was aware of that ruling taking place. They, they implemented it in March 2003. I first was, was aware of it in February 2003. And I thought, wow, how wonderful. We've had issues as black players in the UK finding a way to infiltrate the system, as I like to say, because you know, we, have, we weren't allowed or weren't deemed to be fit enough to become coaches, let alone managers. So maybe some initiative like this would help in order to at least give those who make the decisions the, the obligation of having to address people that they would never come in their normal historical network circle that they go to, of the preferred agents that they use, of the, um, the CEOs, friends and, and, and contacts that they have. It's kind of a closed shop. Mm -hmm. So this would enable to, to open up that level for others to be able to enter, who are qualified, who are ambitious, who have the credentials to become managers. And I thought, what a great initiative. I'm going to bring that to the UK. I brought it to the UK in 2004 to John Barnwell, League of Managers Association. He was like, yeah, this is really great. You know, we, we see where we can go with this. Didn't hear anything. I brought it to the steering group that the PFA, Premier League, Football Association, Football League, everyone had put together for ex-black players and the transition of getting into management. How can we help? What can we do? And they'd been going 18 months and there was nothing that had come out during that 18 months that would at least give an opportunity to have a discussion. So I said, well, this is what's going on in America. How about us trying to implement something like that? There's no guarantees. It just creates a, an opportunity to be heard and to be seen which is not there currently. They went away three months later, they come back and said, well, it might be construed as positive discrimination. In America, you're allowed to do that. In England, you're not really. I said, well, it's not really because it's the willingness to change the landscape to what's been status quo for years and years and years. I said, okay. So I left it. I, by that time, I, mean, I went to America in 2003 and met with all the people that set this thing in motion. Um, the lawyer was a lady called Belinda Lerner at the NFL, and her and Belinda and I exchanged information for, for years until I presented it all to the PFA, Pat, or you, was well, at one time. Yeah. Well, I, I presented it to them and said, well, here you are, here's my contacts in America, let's see if we can make something happen here. Didn't hear anything. Cyrus Myrie, the gentleman, came to address the House of the Parliament in 2011. My name wasn't mentioned. Came over and, and, and met with the, the big wigs over in the UK. I was in America at the time, actually, and I just heard about it for an article. 2016, they introduced the Voluntary Recruitment Code, which suggested that, that English teams will interview someone from a minority background, and it was piloted by 10 teams. That was has been seen to be just the mockery because there's a caveat within there that once the season starts, they don't have to adhere to the pledge and the policy that they, they've made. They can revert back to type, which is sign whoever they want and their preferred candidate. So it was a four month window at the end of the season, which allowed you to be seen potentially. So move on a couple of years again, this is 215, 216, 217, the, the FA decided to roll out the Rooney rule um, verbatim as it stands there. Why? Because Mark Sanson, I believe, 
was a manager, England manager of the women's team at the time. He was embroiled in some kind of uh, discrimination issue with Emmy Luca, who's now in LA, and suddenly the FA had backed Mark Sanson, and it then transpired that everything that Emmy Luca had said regarding the discrimination she received was backed up through texts and things with other players. The FA then, within three months, rolled out the Rooney Rule. Again, no mention of Ricky Hill, no mention of thanks. They went to great pains to thank the Premier League, thank America, thank the PFA, thank everyone, and my name was absent. And this is my vision. I'm the architect of this coming here. I didn't do it just for myself, although I've been on this struggle in terms of being able to infiltrate the system and have longevity in my post-playing career. I've been away, I'm a three-time Coach of the Year award winner, all in professional leagues. <coughs> Twice in America, once in Trinidad, you know, I've taken teams in the Champions League and qualified for the Champions League in Trinidad. And so my body of work has been very good since I've left, but I'm not embraced by the system in the UK. I haven't, I've had one interview in 2003 with Sir Alex Ferguson at Carrington for two hours. They had the reserve team post available. A great two hours, Sir Alex. And he said to me at the end of it, Ricky, I'm going to, I'd like to offer you the position. But Maurice Watkins is away, the solicitor. When he comes back, we sort out the, the terms and the provisions within. So okay, Mr. Ferguson, thank you. He said, you, once anything is important, you have to make sure you go home to see your family because family's important, even though you're going to be in Manchester. So during that week, unbeknownst to me, um, Ricky Severa was at Sunderland and Howard Wilkinson and Steve Cottrell had just joined Sunderland and Ricky Severa was the reserve team coach and he thought to himself I'm not going to get on well with Howard Wilkinson and, and he phoned Craig Brown he said is that Manchester United position still open and Craig Brown said well, I think so I'll let check he phoned Dr Alex yes we, we, we kind of looked at someone the last one Ricky then interviewed during that week that Morris the sister was away and I got a phone call, my daughter's in the crowd here. She, Sir Alex had phoned and she said, oh, there's some Scots gentleman that kind of, <laughs> she couldn't work out. Well, and he's going to call later, I wasn't home. He called later that night, he said, Ricky, you know, you've, you interviewed fantastically. I know we spoke about it, giving you a position, but since that time, someone else came in and he's got his A license. And at that time I had my B license, I didn't have my A license. He said, we're going to go with that. So I said, okay, thank you, Mr. Ferguson. Thanks for letting me know, not a problem. That's the only interview I've had in 20, 20 years since I've left Luton Town as a manager for four months in 2000. Yeah, uh, again, that's a story that um, resonates, I think. Um, so for you, Pat, what, your view of the Rooney rule as a implications I, for the English game? I love the phraseology which you said there, you get right in the middle of it all, because everyone thinks that the Rooney rule is pure positive discrimination. And that way you'll upset people. What it has to be is what, exactly what Ricky says. It gets you on the interview list, treated seriously, and I have you the will, the talent, because there's no, I've not yet met anyone from any sphere who wants to get a job because of their colour, because of who they are. They want it because they are capable of doing it. And that is the point you absolutely made. And it's the point that's often overlooked. 